questions, and I, I was that one more person. Um, I appreciate it. It was relatively relatively short notice for this this talk, and the idea. We'll get into sort of what the idea behind this, but um, my name is Luke Snelling. Um, I am the director of, uh, of a nonprofit called Energize Vermont. Relatively new, about two years old now. Uh, we're a 501c3. Uh, we basically were set up to advocate for renewable energy solutions in the state that are are within that are in harmony with the character of the state. So what that tends to be for us is smaller scale solutions. So residential or community scale solutions, things that we think can fit in communities that aren't necessarily divisive um, and are, are, are things that we can address our energy needs immediately, which is, is important. Um, and the other thing that is important to know about us is that we're 100% member supported. So uh, when part of our mission is education, and that's why we're doing talks like this all across the state. We're, they we're not backed by, um, you know, sometimes people say, well, you're all about just keeping Yankee open. No, we're none of that. Um, it's member supported, so it's Vermonters like you that have uh, supplied the funding for these types of meetings. If you found that uh, the message of smaller scale renewables or community sized renewables is something that's appealing to you and you wanted to support that voice, I encourage you to go online at energizevermont.org um, and slash join and you can become a member. Membership is free. The more people that join, obviously the bigger the organization gets, uh, hopefully the bigger the voice gets. So I appreciate that. The other thing is I, I thank each of you for coming tonight. It's absolutely beautiful beautiful uh, outside and I'm not going to remind you any more of that. So we, oh good, it's, yeah, perfect. Um, we have two speakers tonight. Uh, it really the one thing that the, the talk about tonight is one of the things that I've seen as I've talked to more and more Vermonters about energy is they've said to me, you know, and we've engaged on this issue of utility scale wind and they said, well, what's the big deal with wind? And, and this is when you talk to most folks, they say, well, we support utility scale wind. We support wind. We have to do renewable energy. We have to, have to, have to do it. With the way that global warming is going, we must do it. But then when they get into the nuances of utility scale wind, particularly with what is unique about Vermont, that's where the trouble starts and that's where it brews and that's where the controversy begins. So the goal of tonight is to really answer that question. What's the big deal about utility scale wind in Vermont? The first thing that's going to happen is we'll discuss the impacts from developing utility scale wind here in Vermont and then we'll talk about its potential and if there are alternatives that uh, vie with it and which are, are maybe smarter paths for us. We have two great speakers tonight. They're actually right here in the corner of the room. I think most of you met them as you, as you came in. Annette Smith Annette Smith is the executive director for Vermonters for a Clean Environment. They're a uh, nonprofit that's over a decade old now. They specifically work with communities, most often with communities that are addressing some sort of development. So, um, and, and sort of figuring out what the right role is for that development in that community and making sure that that community has a voice in a stakeholder, typically a stakeholder process. So Annette has traveled to and worked with almost every community in the state that uh, is facing in some way a, a utility scale wind development. So she has a lot of knowledge about this stuff and she also has a lot of knowledge about Vermont's communities as well. Uh, professor Ben Luce is a professor at Linden State College. He'll be the second speaker tonight and he takes a very technical look at utility scale wind in Vermont, what its potential is, and he really goes through it from the numbers. So Annette is the community side, Ben is sort of the technical numbers side. Uh, I'm gonna ask one thing of you guys hold your questions to the end. Th this is designed to, for them to speak and then we'll have a, a good, really great back and forth, but um, hold those questions to the end because we have one tape for the camera that we want to get through and then we're going to swap the tapes and then we'll do the question and answer, but we got to keep it condensed for that one tape. And with that said, in the spirit of keeping it condensed, I will uh, toss it right over to Annette and she'll go first. So thank you guys. Okay, thank you all very much for coming tonight. And tonight we're gonna to talk about utility scale wind or industrial scale wind or big wind or large wind, whatever it is, if you use the wrong word, people say, oh, you called it that. So mostly the problem is that we're having trouble engaging in the discussion at all. So we're gonna have that discussion tonight. Uh, first, a little bit about Vermonters for a Clean Environment. We work with citizens in their communities. We've worked with some of you. Uh, we've worked with at least three different uh, community issues in Middlebury, and we like to provide facts and information so people can make informed decisions. We 
help raise the voices of Vermonters so that they can have us uh, participate in the regulatory process effectively. And for the last five or so years, we've really been trying to engage the businesses and the community members in a stakeholder process that involves joint fact-finding. We have had uh, one success in the Middlebury area with the Carrera uh, East, East Middlebury gravel pit. And they did do that instead of the dueling experts, and it was relatively successful. So what you need to know is the title of our talk tonight about utility scale wind. Well, most Vermonters say that they support wind energy. And when most Vermonters think about wind energy, what they think about is probably the Searsburg turbines, which are the only uh, existing operating turbines in Vermont. They were put up in 1998. They're 197 feet tall. They don't have lights because they're under the 200 foot requirement by the FAA. They are not very visible. There aren't very many people nearby, although I have visited with people who are bothered, especially there's noise from them, and, and those are known to have a lot of mechanical noise. When I saw, first saw them in 2001, I thought they were beautiful. This image has, is used frequently in newspapers. It's been used as recently as uh, the end of July. So it is uh, very much what people think of when they think of utility scale wind. Yeah, all right, well, let's see if we can make it happen. This is a video of the uh, operating turbines. There are 11 of them, they're 0.5 megawatts. One collapsed in 2008, and that's the one that is not turning. It was replaced last December, and it has not yet started operating as far as I know. What's happened with these wind turbines since that went in was that they've gotten bigger. So where those were 197 feet tall, uh, by 2004, they were 200 feet tall. By 2008, they were getting up to 420 feet tall. And now the projects that we're seeing proposed for Vermont are three megawatts, and they're over 450 feet tall. So these are the projects that uh, have been approved by the Vermont Public Service Board. The Sheffield project's being built for 120 feet. Deerfield's been approved uh, for 10 feet. And these two are, have also been approved at 460 feet now. This is the very first picture I taught, took of the big wind turbines. This is Cohocton, New York. They're clipper turbines. It's the first <laughs> wind project. There are 50 of them. And it's the same uh, company and the same turbine as being constructed in Sheffield. And I went there with uh, a friend who invited me to go along. and. Uh, we both had been to, she to Searsburg. We both thought they were beautiful. And we, we just were sort of taken aback. We were like, wow, they're big. I mean, in person, they're really big. And not only are we saying, noticing that, but the uh, spokesperson for what we call the IRA project said, in, and they had many, many public hearings, they're big. They're very, very big. And that's, that's something that a, a lot of Vermonters have not factored into their thinking. So we're going to take a look at what wind turbine construction on Vermont mountains looks like. And this is a three or four minute video. Much of it came from the internet. That first was a Met Tower, meteorological monitoring tower. Then these are photos of Sheffield and the site clearing there. So you first have to clear the site. That's uh, Sheffield. And it's a major industrial operation. That's Kibbe, Maine, then blasting. This is how it's done. Uh, on flat ground. They pour the cement. They have to put in the concrete rebar. They have to, and that's in Maine, so you have to get all these trucks to the tops of the mountains, and then they have to be backfilled, and then they have the crane, and the cranes have to be brought up to the tops of the mountains. That's the nose cone, the blades. There are three of the turbine bases. They weigh uh, something like 200,000 pounds, so for the 16 turbines, going up in Sheffield, that involved um, about 132 of the big truckloads. This is Jiminy Peak. It's a 1.5 megawatt turbine. They pull them up. They push them up. And that's the nacelle. The most common one is the GE 1.5. Now, that's a 3 megawatt going up in Maine. They had, there's the crane. There are about two companies that do this work. Maine Drilling and Blasting does the blasting. Reed and Reed does the construction. They're both out of Maine. So first they put the base in. Then they put the second one in. It's all bolted together. And the third one. Then they raise up the nacelle. 
And then sometimes the blades go up in one piece like that. Sometimes they go up one at a time. That's then the end result. That's Kibbe Main, 3 megawatt. And then there's also the transmission lines that go with them. Now, this is the Sheffield project. This was taken about a month ago, a flyover of that site, which is currently under construction. And yes, apparently it was hard to hold the camera still on an airplane. So. And they were definitely flying above the legal limit. So there, this involves about seven miles of new roads, 16 bases. It's right next to the interstate on I-91. You can see it if you're driving south on I-91. It's not very visible if you're driving north. And this covers about two mountaintops. They happen to be the highest mountains in the area. And then there's the Velcro transmission line, which is one of the things that makes it attractive. You have to have a transmission line nearby. So when you think about building wind turbines in the Midwest, it's relatively simple. You don't have to uh, do any blasting. There's no streams to cross. They're not, you know, there are issues with uh, people who live around them when in the Midwest, so I don't want to say there aren't, but you can build them in the Midwest in areas where it's not populated, and it's simple road building, and they have the best winds. So what's different about Vermont? Utility scale wind in Vermont, you have to build them on the tops of mountains. That's where our wildlife habitat, pristine water sources, and our tourists are attracted to. And so in evaluating what it means to build this technology in Vermont, it's important to recognize the unique attributes that, that we have in Vermont. This is a graphic of the projects that we know about that have been proposed. The ones in orange are the projects that have been approved by the Public Service Board. And in addition, the Lowell project has been approved since this was put together. The ones in gray are what would be called speculative. Uh, although the Grandpa's Knob project is apparently coming along, the, uh, it's that one, the West Rutland, so that's in green. IRA has apparently been put on hold or canceled. Uh, Endless Energy, well named because that's been around for a long time and they keep saying they're going to do it. The Deerfield project, which is in Reedsboro and Searsburg, needs a special, per special use permit from the U.S. Forest Service. It would be the first project built on U.S. Forest Service land and uh, that may be coming out in the next week. Uh, there was one project that was denied in East Haven. There is interest in Grafton. There's some MET towers. Again, that's meteorological monitoring towers up in a couple of mountains in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, there is a MET tower up in Eden. There's another one that's not on this map that's up north of the, the Lowell project. So that area could see three different projects in a line. Sheffield's being built. Uh, Waitsfield, there has been some interest by Citizens Energy. Uh, which has created quite an interesting discussion in Waitsfield and Northfield. Londonderry was originally CVPS Catamount Energy, and then Volkswind came in, and then they went away, and there may be somebody else looking right now. Uh, Derby Line, the developer wants to put two or three turbines. Bolton, developer wants to put six. Woodbury, we're not sure what that is. And um, closest to you folks here, there has apparently been interest in a um, project on U.S. Forest Service land that is in Grafton, and I think it's um, Gillespie Mountain. So that's something to uh, watch, especially if the uh, Deerfield project gets approved. So this is what it looks like um, for the people who live around the projects. There are uh, structures, these are the numbers, within two miles of all these projects, which total about 3,338. Now that could be it's mostly houses, but it can also be businesses. This is 911. Uh, data. And so we, depending on the math you use, whether there are two or three uh, residents per home, we now have five to 10,000 Vermonters who are affected by these projects. And all of them have some unique attributes. The Sheffield project is, is right next to Crystal Lake and the Calendar Brook Wildlife Management Area. The Deerfield project is within two miles of the George D. Aiken Wilderness. The Georgia Milton project is next to Arrowhead Lake. The Lowell project is uh, within two miles of the Missisquoi River, which is in the study uh, 
period for the, as the Wild and Scenic River. The Hubbardton or Ira project has the Hubbardton Battlefield, which has some uh, issues of historic preservation. The Ira project was found by the uh, this Agency of Natural Resources to be a, a rare and irreplaceable natural area. And then there are also issues in Waitsfield and Londonderry. So this is an example of the two mile area. The pink is one mile. The uh, yellow is two miles. This is Lowell. The town of Albany is right here. And so as has happened with just about all these proposals, one town, in this case Lowell, whose town center is over there somewhere, uh, is the town that would get the money, roughly $400,000 a year, while on the eastern side, which is generally acknowledged to get more of the, the impacts, including the noise impacts, you have the town of Albany, which is not getting $400,000 a year. And for the yellow dots around are where people live within the area. These are the people who, as we know from our work on a lot of other issues, the people who are most affected by projects are the ones who dig into it and get the, uh, do the research and very quickly become experts on all the issues. And so it's these people who live in all of these projects around these areas, around within about the two mile radius, but often also further out. They're the ones who are, uh, have the particularized interest, which means that in the public service board process, which is the process through which this is, these, these projects go, they are the ones who have the privilege of forming 501c3s, hiring lawyers, hiring experts, and participating in what is an, a very technical process. And they're the ones that also were called NIMBYs and anti-win. And um, earlier this year, I was at a Department of Energy-sponsored conference at Harvard Law School for wind developers and communities and regulators. And to my surprise, it was about community-based stakeholder processes and joint fact-finding. And the, one of the speakers was the founder of Harvard's um, Alternative Dispute Resolution Program. And he said that those people, those people, the ones who are most affected are the ones who ha you have to have a seat at the table or you will fail. And the wind developers have so far not heard that message. But they were all, almost all of them were there and represented. And we, are, we, we have so far asked three wind developers to do this and the joint fact finding and community based stakeholder and so far we haven't had any takers but it was heartening to hear the, that that message was out there. So what is it that these people are learning? Well they're learning about the impacts during construction and then the impacts after the turbines are up and in operation and we'll take a look at some but not all of these. Habitat connectivity. This is the Lowell Mountains. Oops. There we go. That's the Lowell Mountains as seen from Craftsbury. And Susan Morse, who is a very fine wildlife and habitat specialist, says that our ridge lines link together protected core habitats. Our challenge today is to enhance, nurture, and firmly protect this remarkable connectivity by resisting any temptation to develop and fragment these habitats. The, this, this range has been identified, as have many others in Vermont, as critically important, especially as we um, get, as the climate changes and the wildlife have to adapt. And so staying connected, which is an initiative that's taking place in Vermont, looking at connecting the habitats from the uh, mountains in Maine all the way to the Adirondacks and also north-south have found that this is, a, this is an important area for connectivity. Another issue is habitat fragmentation. And that is an example in Mars Hill. And uh, Eric Sorensen, who is the state natural communities ecologist, testified earlier this year to the Public Service Board that habitat fragmentation is one of the major issues that we face in Vermont and that's affecting our environment, and that projects of the scale of the Lowell Project have a major effect on our environment, and that, frankly, the state has not seen projects like this, and we're still trying to figure out how best to assess the impacts and mitigate the effects. With bears, habitat fragmentation turns out to be a critical issue. Forrest Hammond uh, presented a paper in May in North Carolina about uh, including bear habitat requirements in wind energy project planning. And he notes that compared to ski resorts, the, uh, there, there is a difference and that the potential for habitat fragmentation is greater with the wind projects and that fully half of the projects in the state possibly impact critical bear habitat. And here's some examples. This is the Sheffield project. And this, these dots are the, the bear habitat. And those actually, those are bear scarred trees. And so the turbines are going in the areas that have the bear scarred trees that are being cut. And so that was mitigated by purchasing 
something like 2,400 acres elsewhere. So it, it's, you know, that's what they call mitigation. In the Lowell project, the b black dots are the bear scarred uh, trees, and uh, this is the, the turbine road and ridge line. And so that, again, I, I've also been noticing that the headwaters often are uh, in the same area as the bear scarred trees. Deerfield wind, this is the one that the state opposed, and that's the bear scarred trees on the, what they call the western array, and those are the bear scarred trees on the eastern array. And the state's um, bear wildlife biologist, Forrest Hammond, testified to the Public Service Board that an industrial project the size of the one proposed would displace large numbers of bears from this critical habitat and cause long-term harm to the bear population. It's a genetically distinct population. And this is, this is where the bear scarred trees are. Um, the Public Service Board approved this project. It was a split decision, two to one. And they found that the uh, public good of having wind development in the region, not specific to Vermont, outweighed the impacts to the bears. And it was a, a, a really uh, surprise decision to a lot of lawyers who have never seen something that would be found to be an addu undue adverse impact in Act 250 being overruled by the public benefit of the Public Service Board's uh, law. Another issue that is, is truly unique to Vermont and that it actually has taken me a couple of years to look at. I've been working on this wind issue since April of 2009. And before that, I was working on water. So I'm a little embarrassed to say that it's taken so long to understand that these mountains are our headwaters. They have the purest water and streams and wetlands. And the way that they, they're not like <coughs> knife edge, the way most people may think of the mountains. But when you get up on them, this is the top of Deerfield, the top of Georgia Mountain, the top of the Lowell Mountains. And they take the water in, and the water filters down, and it recharges our groundwater. And it, it feeds the streams in drought and the lakes and streams. And so the importance of these headwaters is something that we haven't really taken a good look at in this state and the value that they play. But it's something that we are now beginning to understand. Uh, this is another image of the top of the Lowell Mountain. This is where the access road comes in and the, it, it intersects with the, what they call the crane path road on the ridge line. So all of this would be blasted away. Some hydrogeologists were hired to take a look at the Lowell Mountains and they did some stream sampling along the edges of the Lowell Mountains. And these critters that they found are indicators of very high quality, clean, cold water. Um, however, Vermont's Agency of Natural Resources is not requiring baseline water quality monitoring. So if there are impacts to the streams, there isn't really a way to determine after the fact what's happened. This is another picture on top of the Lowell Mountains with the, the headwater streams. And then this is another area that uh, the project would clear cut and blast to make a flat road. Now, one thing that uh, came as somewhat of a surprise to me, the hydrogeologists took a look at the plans and they found that these streams would actually be filled. The stream would be filled. The stream would be excavated to place the road. The stream is proposed to be filled and not crossed. 350 feet of the headwaters of this stream will be filled. And another 100 feet of the head of this stream is to be eliminated. And more, this stream over 10 feet of fill is placed in the head of this stream. Approximately 5 feet of fill will be placed in an over 100 foot long segment of this stream. Over 100 linear feet of the stream's headwaters will be filled. And then the headwater and wetland of the head of the stream will be filled. And it's their professional opinion that these projects change the hydrology of the mountain. And there is evidence of that in what's happened in Sheffield. And this is another very short video that shows the condition of the mountain from early May to mid-May. Uh, and this was part, there was a fair amount of sedimentation that was coming off the site. It, in uh, several people's opinion, was not properly buttoned up in the fall. And uh, it's sort of an example of, after the fact, how do you know what was 
caused by this. The Agency of Natural Resources says that this was part of the logging project, and so it's not part of the permit. This comes under acceptable management practices as opposed to best management practices, and in their opinion, this site is a model of how to do things right. So this is concerning, and you see this person there. This is very large. This was an impromptu dam that was put in. The Princeton Hydro people say that they think that the site design has caused the uh, site to be overwhelmed um, and because there's so much water coming off the mountain. Birds. Well, wind tur turbines do kill birds, and that is increasingly a big issue. There was an article in the New York Times just the other day. And the wind industry says that more birds are killed by cats and windows and cars and things. But the American Bird Conservancy has observed that the birds that are killed by wind turbines tend to be uh, more endangered birds like whooping cranes and raptors. And um, this is data that was presented in Maine at a wildlife conference in Maine. And from looking at a number of projects in New England and New York, that's, that's the raptor data. Endangered bats. Uh, we now have added two in bats to the endangered species list, little brown bat and northern long-eared bat. And Scott Darling, the state's bat expert, says there's evidence that taller turbines may actually be killing a greater number of bats. The little brown bat is killed in a fairly large number by wind turbines, and those are the ones that are, are the cave-dwelling bats that are being uh, uh, decimated by white nose syndrome. So the question is, how many more bats can we afford to lose? The recent article in, uh, by um, Bat Conservation International says that there's, you can reduce bat vitalities by up to 93% by shutting them off. You can also reduce what's called the, or increase the cut-in speed if you start at five miles an hour instead of three miles an hour, but we're not requiring that in Vermont. Other issues. This is a very uh, commonly used photo, Mars Hill, Maine. It's sort of everybody's worst nightmare of the blasting. Um, the Maine drilling and blasting people told the residents of Lowell a couple weeks ago that they would be using 700,000 pounds of explosives on the Lowell Mountains. Um, there is no information either at the Agency of Natural Resources or the Public Service Board about what would be used uh, or what has been used in Sheffield or what would be used on Georgia Mountain and the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources has told me in writing that they do not regulate blasting. Noise. Noise is a huge problem all over the world with wind turbines. It's extremely controversial. The wind industry tends to say to people that the noise is about like the sound of conversation. The uh, Public Service Board was told recently in hearings that it's about like what you hear in a library. And there's, the other thing you see a lot is it's like the sound of your refrigerator. What's relevant about Ethan Hall, who lives in Vinyl Haven, is that his home is about 3,300 feet from the turbines. And generally, the wind developers say that if you're within half a mile, you might have problems. But otherwise, you don't. And there are many Vermonters who, whose homes are 3,300 feet from turbines. And Ethan Hall can't live in his house. And one of the big problems is the developers have a pattern of coming in and saying there aren't going to be any noise problems. And then after the fact, when there are, not everyone's affected. Different people are affected differently. And the, no the, the noise can be worse in mountainous terrain and extend out to well over two miles, depending on where you are and what the conditions are like. And so it's a very technical subject that there are, there are all-day conferences on. Ben's going to speak a little bit to the technical aspect of it. But it is a, a very real issue if you're being asked to live near a wind turbine. Property values. There's a, again, there's, a, there's so much spin in this whole su subject matter. You can have the spin of the opponents and the spin of the uh, proponents. And I've been trying to just get to some facts. This is a recent report uh, that by some professors at Clarkson University. It doesn't appear to have any particular bias compared to some of the others. And they looked at three counties in upstate New York, and they found that nearby wind facilities significantly reduced property values in two of the three counties studied. This is the Lowell Ridge right here, and this is the farm of Don and Shirley Nelson. They have a 700-acre farm that borders a mile and a half of Green Mountain Power's Lowell project. And they have been trying to sell their property because they're retired dairy farmers and they need to sell. And they have one of the most unusual and beautiful properties that anybody has seen. It's been on the market for 
uh, well, since about 2003, when Annexco proposed a project up here. And uh, last year, their realtor gave a, a very uh, fact-based presentation about the efforts that he's made to sell the property. Quali many qualified buyers have come to see it, and as soon as they heard about the wind project, they went and bought something else at the same price. Uh, the Public Service Board has approved setbacks for, for property lines on this project of 196 feet. Now the national standard, and there is, there's no real like, standard, but lots of municipalities and states and, have passed ordinances, and so a literature search was done on those. And the, the national uh, average is 1.1 times the total height with the blade extended. If you have ice throw, it's 1.5 times the height. The, and in the Georgia Mountain case, where um, the Public Service Board approved 155 feet from the neighboring property lines, and this is the neighboring property, um, and, and the, the, the purple is the site. So you see how constrained many of these sites are on the ridge lines. Um, and the Department of Public Service recommended 1.1 times the total height, yet the Public Service Board approved what the developer wanted, which was 155 feet. Other issues, always at the top of our list, is how these projects divide communities. We're trying to bring people together to solve problems, and the community divisions are really an issue. Shadow flicker, posting of open land, domestic animals, interference with reception, airspace hazards. There were conflicts for the IRA project with the Rutland Airport. The Northfield Ridge project has conflicts with the gliders in Warren. Uh, the, the Grandpa's Knob project has conflicts for hang gliders. Uh, there are real questions about the impacts on our tourism market and our second homes. And uh, there are also questions about the reliability. Um, we visited one site in Pennsylvania where the site manager told us that the blades uh, have a two-year warranty. They were replacing five blades on a project that had only been in operation for about a year. And the gearboxes have a high rate of failure. Most gearboxes fail within five to seven years regardless of manufacture. And turbines also collapse, catch fire, throw ice and throw blades, and those are things that you have to be worried about or concerned about if you are being asked to live near these. As a result of all of these issues, there is uproar all over the world, Denmark, Canada, Maine, Australia, Germany, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of wind opposition groups all over the world. I'm running an organization that's trying very hard to get away from opposing projects, and so this is an extremely difficult issue for us where we are really trying to figure out how to have a better process around a technology that is so controversial. The other issue is that Vermont's got a brand. We attract tourists. And the Office of Tourism last year did a, uh, a focus group branding survey. And they showed pictures. And they showed lists of words. And the top three words that people who came to Vermont associated with were unspoiled, beautiful mountains. And those are the unspoiled, beautiful mountains next to where I live. It's this uh, a photo or a view that shows up often in Vermont Life magazine. And uh, we have stopped an open pit mine there. This was targeted for wind turbines. A ridge just off there was part of the IRA project. And there was also a proposal for a two-foot natural gas pipeline through the valley. So in the last 12 years, we've had to deal with three industrial development projects. So we understand from our local perspective what it's like to deal with developments on tops of mountains where it turns out that water is a fundamental and very large issue. Two thoughts from two governors. Governor Douglas, who was publicly anti-wind but actually didn't do much to discourage it, said that I hope Vermonters will not be enchanted by the quick and easy entreaty of those who say it's wind, a nice, clean, renewable source. And think about the aesthetic and economic consequences as well as the environmental impact, impact of those huge machines. Governor Dean said this in the context of a discussion about the Long Trail. If you want Vermont to stay Vermont, it's because of the land and the landscape. These kinds of things can never be replaced once they're lost. So this is my house. I have photovoltaic and hot water and a greenhouse in which I grow citrus trees and all kinds of things that you can do. And I'm on the back of a card over there. And so now we'll turn it over to Ben to hear about the alternatives and also some uh, technical information about wind turbines. So thank you. It'll take us a second to get ready, so if you want to stretch, stretch or yeah. cookies. Yeah. I called dibs on it already. Let's see if I can get this 
So this time, as uh, Lucas mentioned, I'm a professor up at Linden State College. Uh, I'm easy to reach. My, name, my email is just ben.loose at lindenstate.edu, and I'm happy to correspond with people by email about this kind of thing. Uh, and of course, Energize Vermont's website is there. I'm just a member. Uh, and I should mention, uh, uh, this is pro bono work by Annette and I. We're not, uh, we're not doing this for any other agenda other than our concern about the issues. Um, so I'm going to cover a couple of, of things uh, from a somewhat numerical perspective, because I want to try to put the issue into a little bit more of a quantitative context. Uh, which is something that's really been missing from the discussion of the issue largely in Vermont. Um, so I'm going to look at wind resources in the eastern U.S. Uh, because really we are a region. Uh, we, you, we have a regional electricity grid and also there are significant issues in the eastern United States as a whole which are very different than the west. Uh, look at alternatives to wind. I'm going to look at very specifically at wind and solar cost trends. That forms a central part of my own viewpoint on the issue. And a little bit, a uh, few comments on the wind turbine noise um, issue. So uh, just to set the scale, I'm, I'm going to refer to this term gigawatts. A gigawatt is a billion watts. And to set the scale, one can um, look at the electricity, the average rate of electricity consumption in the United States. And that works out to be 450 gigawatts. So that means. Uh, you can think of the United States as, con as drawing 450 billion watts of power uh, if you average it out, smooth it out. Of course, it goes up in the day. Whoops. Excuse me. Goes up in the day, falls at night, but on average, this is what it is. Um, another way to think about a gigawatt is what a very large power plant would put out. Uh, the Yankee power plant, for example, uh, Vermont Yankee, is 0.6 gigawatts. Uh, there are very large coal plants that are up at a gigawatt or a couple of gigawatt scales out west. Um, so it's kind of roughly a large power plant. So the U.S. is powered by 450 uh, large power plants. And that really is only about 34, about one third, about one third of our energy usage, about one third of, uh, of uh, the total. So um, you can think of the total energy consumption of the United States being approximately 1,500 gigawatts if you convert it all into electricity. Now to put Vermont in scale, Vermont's energy demand, if averaged out, is about 0.7 gigawatts. Very, very small. We're a drop in the bucket. So our consumption is on average 0.15 percent of U.S. electricity demand. The Lowell Wind Project, if you convert it into gigawatts, it's just 19 thousandths of a gigawatt. Uh, on average, and that's 0.004 percent of electricity demand. Okay, so I'm, that just set, that's kind of just to set some scale. Okay, wind resources, where are they? Um, how do they stack up? This is a map from the Department of Energy uh, it's, that's not too detailed, but it gives a nice overall picture. Um, the, the darker colors are where we have strong wind resources, and you can see in the Midwest there's a lot of wind power resource. I spent about uh, 10 years advocating for utility scale wind power in, in, in New Mexico and specifically for development along here. Um, this is an enormous renewable energy resource, very, very large. The Great Lakes have some. There's some here in these states. Uh, New York has a surprising amount, um, not anywhere near what these states have, but something you can still see on the map. Offshore, there is a fair amount of resource. But look up here, uh, look at Vermont. Uh, New Hampshire, Maine. On this map, it, the wind resources here don't even show up. This is because they're very narrow, sort of one-dimensional resources. We'll look at their, their actual values in a minute. Um, but in general, what I want you to notice is how weak, in general, the, the entire eastern United States is on, as far as onshore wind resource. It's very, very weak. The same is true, actually, for much of the uh, southwest, except for little spots here and there. Okay, um, <clears throat> here are the numbers. So if you rank the top 10 states, Texas through New Mexico, in terms of peak gigawatts, this is what the uh, uh, state, according to the Department of Energy, could, uh, could produce if it basically fully developed its wind resource. Um, Where you get Texas at the top here, 1,900 or so gigawatts, uh, and then down to New Mexico at 492. 
these are big numbers. These are enormous resources. Um, they could power the United States many times over. Uh, this is really the big onshore wind resource. Here's the East Coast. These are all the states in the East that have something over a gigawatt or so. In fact, what's below Massachusetts is even, even much lower than that. So basically all of the wind resource in the eastern United States lies in Maine, Pennsylvania, Vermont, New Hampshire, West Virginia, uh, Maryland, Massachusetts. Um, and uh, I should add New York in there, and I will in a minute when I do a tally of those. I'm not sure why it's not on there. But it's not very much. It, it, some of the, it, on this scale here, it doesn't even show up but barely on, on some, some, some of these states. Um, it, it's, it's, it's actually a very, very small resource. So onshore wind in the east is actually a relatively minor renewable energy resource as, as renewable energy resources go. Um, to drive the point home, here's a comparison to scale roughly between Vermont uh, and Iowa which has a lot of wind resource. Iowa basically has a two-dimensional wind resource. Vermont's very narrowly just along the ridges. And Iowa's worst places are on par with our best places. There's really a dramatic difference there. It may even be, I'm beginning to suspect that Vermont's resources are actually quite a bit worse than even these maps suggest based on what we've been seeing from the, the so-called capacity factors of the Searsburg project and other data. Um, so Vermont's resource may even be um, substantially, not even, not even really commercially viable, but we'll, we'll see. Um, Iowa is laid out in a grid all the way down to the cornfield level. You can develop enormous amounts of wind energy in a place like this, row after row of turbines. Um, Iowa probably has more wind energy development right now than Vermont will ever have um, even if Vermont becomes very aggressive and Iowa's just getting started. There's almost no comparison. Here is the eastern ranking again with New York back in there. And you can see about half of, if you, told, if you tally it up, you can see about half of it is actually in New York. Um, so if you add all of the peak gigawatts up in the east, you get about 52, half of which is in New York. Now, to convert this into a meaningful figure that we can compare with that 450 gigawatt figure, we have to take into account the fact that the, the wind varies in its speed according to a certain statistical distribution. And what you can do is you can, you can define something called the capacity factor. And it, what it is, it's the fraction of this peak number that is equivalent to what these wind farms or wind projects would produce if they were running 24-7. Uh, at peak capacity, and which is what this is. So um, if I assume a generous factor here, if I assume it's 30, the capacity factor is 34%, that's what's considered a, a good commercial wind site, then, then we can consider that this resource at very, very best is equivalent to about 17 or 18 gigawatts of conventional generation. And that's if it's fully developed. And that means wind turbines all over the ridges in Vermont, in Maine, and in, in New York, it would be very oppressive. It would be everywhere you look. Um, and that's what we could do in the east. All right, not, not including offshore. So um, then now if we use that 17 figure, divide by 450, we find that developing all onshore eastern wind could provide less than about 4% of US electricity demand. That's the total. Then if you look at energy and greenhouse gas emissions, electricity generation only accounts for about 34% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. And when you factor that in, you find that at the very best case, wind could reduce CO2 emissions in the U.S. by about, in, um, in the east, could reduce CO2 emissions by about 2%, probably less than 1% in practice. Because it, it's probably, we would probably never see anywhere close to that 52 gigawatts developed because of a lot of real life practical considerations where power lines really lie, um, local siting factors, things like that. Uh, Vermont's entire wind resource, if we really developed that fully, we'd be reducing CO2 emissions by less than 0.1%. So it's, wind is not a big renewable energy source that can really transform the greenhouse gas emissions of the Northeast and the Eastern United States onshore. It just isn't. It's a, it's a minor resource. The only major ones are solar and offshore wind. 
And this summarizes it. This is another wind map. This map, in some ways, uh, is a little harder to read than the other one, but it's a little more detailed. You can really see very exactly where the good wind resources are. You look up here in Vermont, you can see it's just along the ridges there. So the whole eastern United States, less than 2% CO2 reduction potential from wind. Okay, now, so what are the consequences of this? Um, it's not just that wind is a fairly minor resource here, but this has a big implication. It means that if we are really going to make a transition to renewables in this region, it's going to basically have to come from either solar or offshore wind or piping in Midwest wind or something like uh, an, another kind of offshore technology, ocean energy technologies that use waves or ocean currents or perhaps digging down very, very deep in the Earth's crust and doing um, geothermal generation. Uh, that's it. That's basically what we really, if we really want to transform the system, that's what we've got to choose from. Um, offshore wind has very high costs, um, unknown impacts on seabirds, for example. There's almost no biological information on the uh, impacts of offshore wind. And Cape Wind itself, which is barely offshore, is coming in at 27 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, it's not clear at all that offshore wind is going to ever be even close to being cost effective. It might be. They may develop technology to make it that way, but uh, there's no surety of that yet. Midwest wind, we know piping that in on some kind of supergrid would be extraordinarily expensive. Uh, ocean energy, well, it, the technology is just being developed. We don't know anything about its costs or potential yet or environmental impacts. Deep geothermal, well, deep geothermal drilling many thousands of feet down in the crust uh, doesn't appear to be economical yet. I'm being kind to it here by saying unknown costs. Maybe it will make it someday, but uh, it's not there. So if you, if you just look objectively at that, the likeliest option is, is going to be solar. That solar is by far the biggest resource. It dwarfs the onshore wind resource. Uh, it dwarfs the biomass resource. It dwarfs whatever additional capacity we could develop with hydro. It's the big one. And what I'm going to also try to establish is that it actually has the best long-term cost outlook by far of all the others. All right. Um, to give you a more down-to-earth view of what it would take to really develop wind in Vermont, uh, there's, there's some calculations here. If we assume the best capacity factor we've seen yet for the Searsburg project, and uh, we compute what it would take to do 20% of Vermont's power with wind, which is what some advocacy groups are, uh, are, are advocating, it would take um, eight projects the size of the Lowell project uh, to do that. Um, that's basically eight entire mountain systems. In practice, it's probably more like 10 or 12 because the Lowell Project is an extraordinarily large project for Vermont. Most would probably be uh, uh, two-thirds of that or even smaller. So we're looking more probably like 10 to 12 projects. And that's just to get 20%. And interestingly, that's electricity. Uh, Vermont's energy consumption, or especially greenhouse gas emissions, mostly come from transportation fuel and heating fuel we would be looking at uh, getting less than 10% of our actual total energy consumption, actually more like 4 or 5% from that. Okay. Um, to do 100%, this might seem uh, like a far reach, but this is what it would take. Vermont's load is, remember, Vermont's load is not very big. It would take 2,500 megawatts of wind. That would be 40 projects the size of Lowell. That would be all over the place. You wouldn't be able to look at a ridge line and not see turbines, basically, somewhere nearby. A lot of mountain systems. 150 miles of ridge line. That would be from the top of Vermont down all the way to the bottom if you lined them all up in one continuous line. Well, of course, they wouldn't be. They'd be, they'd be blocked around, but, but that, that's what it would take. And that would mean uh, full-size industrial-scale roads, uh, thousands of tons of fill per turbine platform, great deal. All right, and consider that doing all that is only 0.15% of U.S. demand. When you look at it that way, you realize why the wind resource in the east is so limited. Solar resource, okay, well, we can do calculations on that. Um, I actually go out and measure the production of solar systems in Vermont. I know the production figure very well, um, and I can calculate from that. It, Vermont has about uh, 1.2 million acres of open farmland. 
that constitutes about 20% of the state. Um, a solar collection area, in factoring in the weather, everything else, uh, of less than 1% of that, less than 11,000 acres of collection area would cover all of Vermont's electricity needs. And basically all of that could be done on roofs, small systems in backyards, carports, out of the way solar orchards and municipal sites. Um, there is tremendous solar potential actually in Vermont. And it's, uh, solar is considered by many Vermonters to be kind of a negligible or unviable resource. But uh, interestingly enough, it is the big renewable energy source. It's the one that we're probably going to need to really do something with. Um, wind, it, if you actually look at the acreage, <laughs> Uh, wind requires roughly the same uh, acreage in the end uh, when you count all the roads and turbine platforms and other things like that and transmission corridors. Um, but remember, all of, those, all of those impacts are in forests, very relatively pristine forests. Uh, none of that is, needs to be in pristine forest for solar. So um, it's, it's very interesting. The, uh, the impacts are, are entirely different. Uh, this just gets into the Calculation, if anyone wants to see the calculation, there it is for the acreage. Okay, now, uh, costs. What's happening with costs? The interesting thing about solar and wind is that uh, for the last uh, 20 years or so, both of them have been on a pretty steady downward cost trend, at least until about 2000, um, mostly driven by economies of scale, but also technological refinements. Both technologies have been growing exponentially and um, their, the decrease in cost has been well correlated up until about 10 years ago with economies of scale uh, and other little tweaks that happen. Um, currently, we're at about this point. Solar is still more costly from wind on a cost dollars per watt um, standpoint. But the interesting thing is, is that right around 2000, um, wind bottomed out in cost. Um, and this is because wind technology intrinsically relies on very large amounts of cement, steel, copper, special metals, massive site preparation, uh, transmission, things like that. In fact, a lot of the transmission cost isn't even in here yet, but uh, this is mainly the cost of just putting something uh, close to a, a wind farm. And this cost may be conservative, actually. But in any case, it's been uptrending. And if you just do a straightforward projection, um, what, what, what it appears to be the case is that these will Equal in, will be equal in cost per dollar watt of capacity um, before 2020, which is relatively soon. And so what I would like to suggest to you is um, we need to take that into account. This is where the costs are actually going. We have very good reason to believe that solar is going to keep on its downward cost trend. Um, this uh, this kind of trend analysis is missing from the decisions that go on currently. Right now, our PSB only makes decisions based on a slice. They just look at the cost right now. They're not looking at the cost trend. None of that's been included in any of the proceedings or energy plans or state policies. Um, this graph shows where the data came from. The PV trend data is from Paula Mintz. She's the best PV anal industry analyst in the, uh, in the country. Um, to get that curve, I, I added costs of, of the um, inverter and other balance of system costs, and I didn't assume any decrease in costs of the other components. Uh, the wind data cost comes from a uh, Natural Resources Defense Council study, uh, and I added a dollar per watt to that to account for the higher costs of ridgeline wind projects, as these come from mostly um, uh, Midwest projects, but 238 of them. So a lot of data behind that. Okay, additional costs. Um, it turns out wind appears to have some hidden costs in the Northeast. Uh, utilities and uh, the uh, integrated system operator, which runs the grid in the, in the east, is looking uh, very closely at adding uh, 3,000 uh, megawatts of hydropower and about 5,000 megawatts of wind power uh, sometime in the next 10 years. And They've done cost studies and figured out how they would have to add transmission to make the system work with wind. Wind has very specific uh, properties, uh, and it, it turns out to require a lot of new transmission to make it work. And it turns out, according to the uh, CEO of the, uh, uh, um, of the Northeast ISO, which is basically the, the, the chief, chief grid operator, uh, grid chief as they call him here in the article, uh, it's going to cost 7 to 12 
$12 billion to add that. When you add these costs in to the actual cost of the wind power, it doesn't even look like wind is competitive with solar today. And that's a hidden cost that is not being discussed. Right now, Lowell, for instance, Sheffield, they're just being built near where there's existing transmission. All of those easy transmission sites will be used up in a few years. As I said before, wind is intrinsically dependent on large amounts of materials. Photovoltaics are a totally different animal. Uh, now photovoltaics are moving into the thin film era. Uh, they're getting even much less material intensive than they have been. We're looking at PV panels now that are uh, about a hundredth of what the previous width was. Uh, PV systems have no moving parts, no matter streams, um, no intrinsic need for cement, steel, copper, things like that, uh, except for small amounts. And um, really, uh, the cost reduction potential is much greater. Um, as some evidence that, this, that the cost trend for solar will continue or is likely to continue, this, is, this photograph is from an article um, just this year announcing uh, GE's um, announcement that they're going to build a massive uh, thin film uh, manufacturing plant in the U.S. for PV. Uh, this is going to revolutionize the whole uh, photovoltaic uh, cost and uh, manufacturing picture in the United States. Um, this factory will, in, it's just in, in its initial phase, will be able to produce enough PV power for 80,000 homes per year. Looking a little bit more closely at the solar cost trend, now instead of, whoops, instead of peak wattage, if I convert this into kilo, dollars per kilowatt hour, one gets a cost trend graph like this. This goes back all the way to 1978. This, was, this graph was actually produced by Emmanuel Sachs. He's a professor at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, this shows another aspect of what's happening with PV costs. Um, the cost per kilowatt hour is on track to reach what's called grid parity in just the next few years, and in particular to meet, to, meet uh, to basically equal the cost, the typical cost of retail power in the United States by about 2015. That's right around the corner. The reason you're starting to see lots of photovoltaic development in the U.S. is because of this convergence. People see this coming. Um, it's getting closer and closer and closer, and uh, it doesn't have to even become competitive with wind. It really only has to become competitive with retail costs because PV is a distributed technology. It competes with retail electricity costs, not wholesale. So it has a better cost trend from that standpoint than a lot of people realize. Um, this is a nice graph, too. It shows a lot of the little technical refinements that were made along the way to get there. Okay, finally, um, I wanted to mention a few things about uh, the noise issue. The noise issue was something that I was a, uh, a slow convert on. Uh, I believed, I think, in, uh, much of the wind industry uh, statements that this was just an issue that what people were overreacting to and trying to use the issue in an invalid way to defeat wind. Uh, but then I uh, <laughs> started to look more into the issue and um, Things, uh, for example, last year, a, uh, we started to see peer-reviewed research on the uh, topic get published. Annette has a whole slide full of these uh, publications now. Um, this is one of the first ones I found. Um, and what's become apparent is that there really is a problem with wind turbine noise. And the fundamental reason is, is these things put out very low frequency noise, even subsonic noise, what people call infrasound. They basically shake the air in a low frequency manner. Um, and it's easy to understand why this is the case. When you put something with blades that are 200 and some feet long, uh, moving at high speed through the air, and it's anchored to a large structure that is then anchored into the ground, um, you can get very uh, dramatic um, interaction between the materials of the blade and the air. Uh, for instance, bats are often killed near wind turbines blades just when they, just when they fly close enough to the blades, the decompression is enough. To, 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 uh, to kill them. So they produce a lot of, of this low frequency noise and the noise has a spectrum, uh, so-called spectrum or spectral uh, uh, plot profile, which is uh, startling. Um, most sources of noise will have some peak, say in the audible, maybe, or maybe in the subaudible range and then decay. Uh, wind turbine noise is kind of special. Um, this graph shows a log scale down here. Human beings can hear down to about 20 hertz, 20 cycles per second. That's about here. 
So you can see at some distance away, now this whole graph depends on some, some reference point for a particular turbine. If you go back farther, the whole line will shift down. If you get closer, it will shift up. So the absolute scale is not important here. But what you can see is as you go down to lower and lower frequency, the, um, the decibel level, which is also a log scale, uh, goes up and up and up. And, and these can be very high decibel levels in close. So even if the wind turbine doesn't sound like it's making a lot of noise, it's probably making a lot of uh, infrasonic noise. And the key thing about the research, for instance, this article in hearing research is showing now that um, this infrasonic noise can actually have a physiological effect on human beings. It can change the physiology of the cochlea. People don't know yet how or if that causes health effects, but there is a lot of anecdotal evidence suggesting that a lot of people have profound problems sleeping, for example, and this leads to other problems with nausea and, 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 other, and other issues. Um, and it's, in my opinion, it's, I think there's probably something to it. And, uh, and I also wonder about, if this is going on, um, what happens with animals like bear? and moose and other critters living around these things on the mountaintops. Uh, I think we may be looking at a serious ecological issue here that hasn't been fully explored. Um, on the other hand, uh, here's the impact of solar. It just sits there. You can do this in fields, very low footprint relative to the array. Stuff can grow around. You can you can have uh, livestock around these things, and you can even grow around them. It doesn't even shade the ground too badly because the sun changes its position. Um, last comment I want to make is about the uh, general energy uh, plans and profile of Vermont. Um, interestingly, most of Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions do not come, are not associated with electricity. Even if Yankee goes away, the vast majority Will, will come from gasoline and diesel, heating oil, propane, natural gas, those kind of things. Those carbon impacts far outweigh what will come from electricity. So the question is, why are we so focused on electricity in Vermont? Uh, my answer to that question is, we have a number of renewable energy businesses who are in the business of renewable energy electricity. They have the dominant voice along with utilities at the state legislature and they have framed the policy largely to serve their own short-term development agenda. Uh, also, I would say, in my opinion, Vermont's energy policy is, a, is in a complete shambles. Uh, its support for small-scale renewables right now is almost non-existent. It's been inconsistent. Uh, the support for large-scale wind energy has been very strong. Ratepayers are going to be paying for hundreds of millions of dollars of, of utility-scale wind and hardly anything for small-scale development. This is a heating fuel, uh, fuel profile in Vermont. Um, a lot of people do heat their homes in Vermont with wood, but it's a very small fraction, in fact. Our heating fuel is most, our heating source of energy is mostly fuel oil, propane. We could make enormous impacts. The money we're putting into wind could cut far more CO2 emissions just being invested in, in um, thermal envelopes of increased, increased energy efficiency of buildings, uh, better insulation, lower leakage rates, that kind of thing, and fuel switching. So um, just from an objective standpoint, if we really want to decrease CO2 emissions rapidly, we want to do so cost effectively, and we want to do so in a way that's going to be politically viable, socially viable, will not fragment communities. A better plan for the state would be, in my opinion, to focus on things like Vehicle efficiency, uh, fixing internal combustion vehicles, higher efficiency vehicles, mass transit, making the transition to electric vehicles, weatherization, biomass, geothermal. At the same time, um, photovoltaics are not completely there yet in terms of being super cost competitive, but I think they're going to get there. And we could plan for that. We could do what we can in the meantime, find the good places for solar orchards. There's an enormous number of them that haven't been prospected train people, get the, get the installation infrastructure off the ground. And then as photovoltaics get down to a, a cost competitive level, which I believe they're going to soon, then around 2015, 
we continue the previous efforts and we really expand the photovoltaic build out after that. That would be a rational energy plan based on impacts, cost, greenhouse gas emissions. Currently, the energy plan in Vermont takes none of those larger factors. It's essentially just a hodgepodge of stuff advocated for the sake of a couple of, of groups. Okay, and that's the end. So proponents will say it's contributed to renewable energy generation, it's going to lower greenhouse gas emissions, and we all benefit. And I think there's some validity to that in the sense of decreasing emissions. It's debatable whether these are in this grid, low in this near term frame, we're going to do much of that. Right. Grid, not, not across the US figures. Yeah. It's going to create electricity for X number of thousand homes. So I think we, I've been through enough of the presentations. Those are basically what is outlined. In some of the projects, Actually, the Lowell project is the only one where the cost to consumers has been disclosed. The Deerfield project is confidential. The Georgia Mountain project is confidential. And the Sheffield project is confidential. There's no process for getting those data? It's been held confidential, however, because Green Mountain Power is a public utility, they had to disclose it. And their cost to consumers starts at, uh, when it comes online, 16 cents a kilowatt hour and comes down to an average cost over the lifespan of the project at about nine or ten cents. Including including Close uh, maintenance to costs. Replacing the blades, replacing the cells, replacing the Right. Oh, and yeah. That's not a very competitive cost for retail power. That's that's closer to retail than it is to wholesale costs. So it's expensive. The monitors are going to be paying they're going to be paying over the long run for the projects that are on if all the projects that happen, especially the Matt the, the, the Matt laid out, if all those projects happen. It's going to be hundreds of millions of dollars extra in rates paid over about 20 years. However, Green Mountain Power says that it is the lowest cost renewable that they can get to meet the speed requirements that are part of what Ben is saying is this flawed legislation and why our renewable energy policy in the state has, has failed. What they haven't factored in is if they incentivize people to build their own systems, people will contribute a lot of money to their own systems. There's a lot of avoided transmission costs and other things like that. Nobody's done that calculation. PSB has not made any any factor, any consideration like that in the proceedings. So, it, now, so well, there are other people that benefit too. By you know, by the way, you know, utility executives. These are short-term projects. People are making years off these things. There's a lot of corporate executive discussion, right? These guys make huge amounts of money when they spearhead projects like this. And the shareholders who are guaranteed a nine nine percent rate of return. Mm -hmm. And they amortize these projects. They're, they're written off in taxes very quickly. Five years. So from a corporate perspective, even though it may not be very cost effective for the ratepayers, from the corporate perspective, the package they put together is actually very bad, can be very beneficial. There's, the, the, there are a lot of complex financing things that go into it. I think Luke has a, a write-up on it on Energize Vermont's website of the so several different financial people have actually looked at all the production tax credits, the, the grants, the, and, and then some of the other uh, really complicated types of accounting that come, come along with these projects. So there are lots of ways to make a lot of money. And one of the reasons I went really fast through my presentation is because that's how fast these projects are going. And that if you happen to be in a neighborhood with one, you are all of a sudden hit with something that is like a speeding bullet train. Mm -hmm. And you don't have any time to do anything other than get up to speed and try and participate in the process. And then after the decision comes out, realize that you just wasted all your money and your time because the process is geared towards getting those permits out. It's not really geared towards uh, what, you know, what we would like to see as a more community involved. And, and that, that situation is aggravated right now by the fact that the, these, these federal stimulus funds are about to expire and they've got to get these projects in the ground to get those. So what appears to be happening is ANR is just cutting 
questionable deals, um, not really looking, not really factoring the environmental criteria, just kind of just kind of rubber stamping. Uh, yeah, and if, if you want to see some uh, of the tail of that, uh, look at that seven days that Shay Totten. I just saw it today, tonight. I just came out today. Shay Totten's article. Uh, they're not. Uh, there was strange stuff going on between the Shumlin administration and Three Mountain Power and the NR uh, around the Lowell project, and uh, they're not making the emails and other data public. So I think there's something. I have a question. I did see the very incredible quote from the executive elsewhere, but I was a little surprised earlier not to see hydropower anywhere on on the skin in in New England and in this state anywhere on the list of possible possibility that even on small scale hydro, let alone the dams that, that our yeah. governor didn't buy. Uh, but there's a reason there's a for potential that. For, for small scale hydro. Yeah. There's a reason for that. Yeah. Um, there's a woman named Lori Barr who's done a great job at, and she's probably, <laughs> since I didn't list hydro, she's probably very mad at me for mentioning her good work at this, but she did a very good job of summarizing what she thinks is the potential <laughs> to look at all the dams around the state, possible dams around the state or existing what could be done. She estimates about 90 megawatts additional generation could be added. Um, that's about a little more than a tenth of Vermont's current generation demand. So we could do a little bit with hydro in Vermont, but what I'm trying to emphasize is if we're going, if we're going to decrease CO2 emissions in the e eastern west, we have to build thousands of gigawatts of renewable generation. And, Solutions that can't contribute at, at at least the hundreds of gigawatt yeah. scale are essentially irrelevant to the argument. It doesn't mean they, they hurt. If, if they can be done cost effectively with low environmental impact, by all means do them. They, they, won't, they won't hurt, but they're not really going to help much. And if people, if people grab onto those, they're going to miss the, the big picture. And what's been missing in Vermont is the big picture. The big picture is a regional, national scale challenge. Uh, and the United States and Vermont have been ignoring, putting real emphasis and support on the solutions that really make a difference. There are and different people then in the, the Silver Orchards, several of which have gone up along right. the Ferrisburg Quarter and down near Rutland and North and very different people involved in, in processes and, and uh, uh, incentives and for those these. And we've got a handful of those projects, but for instance, the SPEED program supported only 50 megawatts of new small-scale stuff. Only a little piece of that was for solar, and the program was structured in a bizarre way that it paid the full, it paid a full non-market cost for solar power that was probably too high, instead of just paying people a more modest per kilowatt hour incentive to be combined to, to pancake along the federal tax credit and their own investment and other things like that, they could have gotten 10 to 100 times more solar generation out of the incentives that they've been, they've been structured. But the reason they did it was because of, uh, there was a handful of developers who wanted that tariff to support their own pet projects. So, so, so in, in Vermont, okay. the best opportunity for hydro has been identified by the agency of natural resources as repowering existing dams and just redoing the generators and getting more power out of them. There does seem to be some opportunity there. But we'd all like to have more uh, you know, hydropower, but until we come up with that little magic thing we can just stick in the stream, uh, it's, it's a very complex process and, and has a lot of environmental impacts that are negative. Too. There are ANR people who deeply oppose a lot more hydro because of fish. I don't have a, I don't have, I'm not qualified to make an opinion on that. Thank you. Another source of energy that worries me is the biomass electrical generators that would be using wood from these same forests. I, I think that's another crazy option because if, if you add up, a, there's a study showing you could get about another million tons out of Vermont for of biomass sustainably. That translates into very little power generation. We have a huge biomass plant up in, up in uh, just east of Mon uh, Burlington, the McNeil plant. Uh, it's, only, it's, it's only doing 5% of Vermont's uh, electricity. But trees are terrible solar collectors. Very, very low efficiency. Um, they're you know, a, about a hundredth of what a photovoltaic panel can do per square area. 
So um, it, you'd have to have a, a huge, just to provide Vermont's power with biomass, it would take a huge area of the state, essentially being under cultivation for energy crops. If you, you look at the Northeast, it's as, it's as weak or small as, as wind on, on in the East. It's, it's a minor source and it's arguably very destructive. There's a, there's a group also that put out a study, for, uh, uh, it was an institute, uh, I can't Mountain, Mel something institute uh, down in Massachusetts. They did a study of carbon sequestration of soils and biomass. You know, that's, you're familiar with that? And mm -hmm. their conclusion was it's not even carbon uh, neutral. It's way far, it's, a, it's almost as dirty as a natural gas fire. Well, there have been two proposals, one in Bennington County and one in Rutland County, Fairhaven and Pownall. And the Bennington County Regional Commission did an evaluation of the fossil fuel consumption for all the trucking and all the harvesting of the wood and found that it was really quite astonishingly large and would overcome any benefits that, I mean, it just, it, it's not sustainable. That was their conclusion. Now, there is a big push to put the one in a panel which involves a five mile pipeline from Lake Champlain mm -hmm. and piping it and then discharging the water. Originally it was gonna be 80 degrees and uh, we, looked at the, we looked at it at the Regional Planning Commission in, in Rutland and um, the ability to get that much wood for the plant, they were looking at oh, somewhere between four and 500,000 tons of wood, I think. It's basically what was identified by Burke's study as what is available in all of Vermont. So while this is another controversial issue with a variety of impacts, there is right now a really strong desire from the people in Fairhaven to try and get that plant going. So there's so many sources of energy to oppose. There's a couple to oppose. Is there a way that we can get Thing we support. Well, that's what we're. That's kind of what we're trying to do. We're trying to. We're trying to look at both sides of the coin. Because what, what's going to work? There's groups that just oppose wind, and there is a wind opposition movement out there that that really is funded by the fossil fuel industry. That really is trying to kill all wind development. Um, you know, and <laughs> uh, we're trying to we're trying to to create a distinct group from that. Uh, there are the same groups that are also trying to kill solar and, and any acceptance of this problem with global warming and whatnot. Uh, I've, but I've lived off grid for 20 years in Vermont with solar, and uh, it really works. Um, I recently upgraded my solar array and installed solar hot water for heating, for heating my office and also for heating water, and it's just fabulous. Mm -hmm. I'm probably closer to getting off fossil fuels than most people that I know, and. There's this sort of myth that it's cloudy, and yeah, it's cloudy November, December, and it's especially cloudy last November, December. But we're also seeing technologies coming along, storage, so or uh, the bloom box, if any of you saw that on 60 Minutes. So if those actually get to market, there is every reason to disconnect from the grid. I mean, it's fine to do grid tied, and that's good too. Huh? Aren't we basically not fighting the technology problem so much as political one. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely correct. Is yes, it's true. Just really the question of do we go for the spirited power or do we go to a centralized system? I, I would say it's also a question of sources come into that. Because as soon as you ask that question, then you start to ask what sources work on that level. Mm -hmm. um, and I think also the public doesn't have a lot of information. Like the, these kind of resource estimates. Uh, I'm seeing, I'm uh, you never hear any wind. factoring of that in. I'm seeing small wind uh, turbines um, each time I drive up and down Route 16. Um, seem to be powering people's houses just fine without yeah. killing bass and without killing birds. Like they, um, so I, I've looked, I've studied the small wind issue pretty closely. In fact, I, 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 uh, I wrote a how-to guide actually for small wind that's on the NBDA website for the state. Um, and uh, there's some, uh, something called the uh, Vermont Renewable Energy Atlas, and it has some nice data on where good wind sites is or, or are. But the fact is, it's, it turns out that very few people have good small wind sites. Uh, you have to be on a pretty good hilltop. So and if you add up all of that resource and you look at the costs, I don't think that's going to be a big player either. The really big one is going to be sold. It's, yeah, I, I, I don't hear you disputing that. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I totally agree, but I think that the discussion of which source is better um, tends to miss the point. 
it might, if you're talking about the politics and you want to educate people on that side, I think you're right, the distributed versus decentralized is a really good way to approach that. Well, in fact, we've met with the Commissioner of Public Service, and that was one of the points that we made to her in developing the renewable, or the energy plan that's going to be coming out uh, in about a month. And that we pointed out that the plan really needs to reflect sort of these dual tracks. And one is big and, you know, transmission lines moving hydropower down into the region. And what most people are thinking about, big wind, big um, you know, biomass plants, this, this really centralized energy that we have had for, for decades, or this move towards distributed energy, even microgrid, where a whole neighborhood could disconnect from the grid, that's all happening. And so there is this other track that's happening, and the utilities, I'm not sure if they're even paying attention to the other track, but certainly as we look forward uh, as a state in our energy planning, this distributed generation is, is where the marketplace is going. And so that's where people's dollars are going to be going, and it is becoming cost effective to produce your own power and use it where you, where you live. And so that's, that's something that we are looking forward to seeing whether or not our input was accepted. So are there, uh, speaking of that, uh, distributed power uh, sourced by solar, are there any states in the United States that are going ahead with distributed solar or other countries, small countries in the world that are not, not here elsewhere that are effectively using solar? There's quite a few U.S. states who have had pretty good solar programs. Um, California has a lot and is still moving forward with it. Um, they're also moving forward with large-scale solar, which is a controversial environmental issue there. Um, but they have, they have a, they've had a very robust program and continue to, in various parts of the state, have even stronger programs like San Francisco. Um, the state I was in, I got through a solar tariff a couple years ago in New Mexico, and we got the kind of PV off the ground there, we, um, and, and that's still continuing, and we have a strong solar tax credit there. Uh, many other states, New Jersey had a much better program than anything Vermont has had, they had a strong program. Internationally, uh, Germany has done a great deal to keep solar on that downward cost and bringing Japan. in the industry. Japan's done a lot. China is now moving into ch solar manufacturing in a major way. They're not using a great deal of it yet, but they're starting to. They're starting to put in some uh, very large solar farms and other things. Uh, and they dominate the manufacturing now. Germany and Japan, which have widely deployed solar, have, we have 30% more sunshine than they do. So this idea that Vermont's not a sunny place, well, other places that have much less of a resource have done a lot more with it. We have about two-thirds what the, the, the desert, the southwest desert has. It's amazing. Okay. It's, it's surprising. But if you add up all, all, look at all the insulation that you can capture, um, one kilowatt PV array can produce about uh, three, three to 3.5 kilowatt hours per day on average. Out of the desert areas, you get five to six. question. I haven't forgotten, forgotten, forgotten my question. Um, oh yes, I wanted to know, do you think that at some point, not too far away, solar will, you'll be able to get power from a solar panel just from daylight, rather than like even on a cloudy, just daylight alone? Uh, the thin film panels are significantly better than the conventional at uh, transforming uh, diffuse sun solar. So you can break solar energy down into diffuse and direct insulation. Uh -huh. and Conventional panels do better with the direct right. for a certain technical reason, mm -hmm. uh, but the thin films do better with the thin. And the other interesting thing about solar uh, photovoltaic panels is they produce better when they're cold. So even though you have less insulation in the winter time, huh. they tend to produce better, uh, and you, that makes up for it somewhat. Huh. Not completely. That's interesting. They're both. It's still an intermittent source. We're still going to need storage and other things like that, and maybe some kind of backup system or some kind of stored energy along with it, but. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other thing I wanted to say is that um, one of the guys, the, the phenomenal Princeton Hydro guys that came up to do a lot of work for us, one of them said to me that regarding the Sheffield project, if what they were doing up there with uh, water, basically, and what they're not doing, if that was happening in New Jersey, it would have been shut down. 
And I thought, boy, is that ironic. You'd be yeah. shut down in New Jersey and not here. Um, I yeah, had an interesting experience. I, I'm sure I shouldn't even say this in public, but I have a close colleague who happened to get a tour of the Sheffield site mm -hmm. um, because she gave one of the Sheffield, she gave the Sheffield foreman, the project foreman, a, a ride. His car broke down. She picked him up hitchhiking. She wound up touring the site. Yeah. She said the whole time the conversation was laced with profan profanity. He said it was one of the worst sites he had ever seen. Didn't know why we were doing it there. Uh, and they said that he had also told her that a German company that they had over there for some reason and involved with it. I'm not sure why, um, said they didn't understand why they, we were doing it at this site. They said so, well, it seemed to be an awful site. So the ANR, the Agency of Natural Resources, is not doing its job, really? Well, in fact, mm -hmm. um, I stood up at a public meeting in Lowell last month and told them that. Right. Said yeah. that you're not doing your job and you're in compliance with the Clean Water Act and we're going to take this to the EPA and the U.S. Army Corps, and in fact, in the last two weeks, we have taken it to the EPA in Boston and the U.S. Army Corps in Concord, Mass. And so they are now looking at the uh, sedimentation that's coming off the site in Sheffield, and they are looking at the permits that are proposed to be issued for the Lowell site, which use an experimental technology called level spreaders that are not appropriate for steep and high elevation sites like the Lowell site. And so those water quality permits to Green Mountain Power is, they, they wanted to start August 1st. Yeah. They had been delayed primarily by their own problems. Their surveyor went up on the site and cut trees before they were allowed to start. And then the landowner went and cleared a whole lot of areas and filled in the wetland that was to be used for mitigation. And so now they are claiming that that's all fixed and please uh, give us our go ahead so that we can start clearing the land and they don't have their water quality permits yet, and so we're watching to see how the EPA and the Army Corps and the Agency of Natural Resources all deal with the uh, very serious issues that we are observing and that qualified professionals have taken to the state agency and they've pretty much been ignored. So the, the, the larger concern here is what kind of precedents are we setting uh, for our high elevation pure waters and the, the, the lack of baseline water quality monitoring, which just does not make any sense. I mean, we, we, no matter how you feel about these big wind projects, the idea that you can sediment up high elevation streams and it not be considered a violation. Or fill them in on purpose. Right, or, or fill them in. What is that, what, what kind of precedence do that set for ridge top development of all sorts? So the aren't state? they in fact currently um, and have been violating the Clean Water Act, in fact, right? Well, you, sediment is sediment. Yeah. Right. So there's stormwater control. Right. It's not that complicated. You shouldn't be putting sediment in the streams. So it is a, a, uh, a big concern for those of us who are sort of looking at the big picture about how, to, how, to, how is our state uh, protecting the environment. Um, Ben, a couple of times you mentioned uh, global warming and, and the concern over global, global warming. You also mentioned that there was a need for more of a macro strategy across what we do here in the state to address um, what we can do and, and how to deal with that. What do you say to the mentality that we're at a state with global warming that we just need to do everything everywhere? That, that yeah. I mean, I, I, this is a very yes. selective viewpoint that we, we have the luxury of preserving our mountains um, at a time when we have to do something about global warming. Right, many of the advocates of big wind, that's basically the paradigm they promote. Is well, we the, heard the it the, by the keynote speaker at a Department of Energy conference we attended, and, and he, it was from the Union of Concerned Scientists, and he was asked that question, uh, aren't there some places that aren't appropriate? And he said, we're at the point where we have to build everything everywhere. Right, and the, the issue I have with that is, um, I think it, in actual fact, it's not so much we'll build everything everywhere, but we'll take anything we can get. We'll take everything we can get. Um, the problem with that is it may mean we don't get what, what, enough, nearly enough, uh, actually. If we let it just be sort of haphazardly spread out like that, without a focus strategy that takes into account the actual resources, the actual cost trends, the political situation around it, how much money we really have to, to we can really marshal in a pragmatic way, towards those things. What we're going to wind up with is a, is a minor renewable energy uh, generation set that's all spread out and haphazard and maybe in some cases very damaging and very divisive. Um, if you really want to optimize the transition, 
I would argue, you've got to get solar off the ground in the East. We should be yelling and screaming about that. Why don't we have good incentives for that? Consistent, easy to use, robust, and long-term incentives for that in Vermont. Why don't we have, well, we, we sort of have it at the federal level. The solar tax credit's not too bad, but they could do more. Uh, why, did, why, why have we let China capture most of the PV manufacturing now? Uh, GE may be changing that, but that up until this point, that's what's happened in the last 10 years. We've really fallen short on that standpoint. Uh, what we've got is, is an energy policy driven by utilities and, and special interests. Well, and then from, from my organizational perspective, what we're seeing is opposition to these big, big wind projects everywhere they're proposed. And so there's a lot of energy in Vermont for doing constructive things. And so instead of marshalling that energy for, for good, everybody's fighting against something, desperate to save these precious mountains. The, the energy going in to save the Lowell Mountains is, is, is extraordinary. So for those who say, well, you got to support wind, and that's basically what I've been told, is that when I've asked for help, well, okay, if I've got the troops on the ground, then help me sell this technology. And, and the answer I get is, you have to support Dick Wynn. And I don't get any help on the ground. I can't sell this technology to Vermonters in their com community. So do we want to actually do something that's going to succeed and make a difference? Or do we just want to continue fighting in our communities? And I'm looking for technologies and processes that will get us all to be working together rather than fighting against something. Just a quick quick follow-up question. You, you said multiple times that uh, you know, we have to do something. Well, uh, what, why wouldn't we build wind when we look at other places that are doing you know, mountaintop removal coal mining? Shouldn't we make sacrifices that are at the similar scale? Shouldn't we be comfortable with that in terms of doing our part? To, to make this my drive. That, that argument's happen. made a lot, but just from a logical structure standpoint, existing destruction somewhere else doesn't justify more destruction over here, yeah. right? It, that's, not, that's not how you should be justifying your energy plan. It's true that, yeah, that destruction is really horrific down there, but that's, it's sort of like saying, um, you know, because some people were killed in a war over here, it's okay to kill other people over here. I mean, it's just, it, it doesn't log, if you think about it carefully, it's not a logical argument. Well, you're well, adding it, insult to injury, basically. Well, yeah. And Luke's playing the devil's advocate. From a technical perspective. Well, you're you suggesting I question their plans? Well, no, I'm not saying that you have to bring things out. Um, the ISO New England grid has some coal plants in it, and some does come from mountaintop removal. However, the Wind resource interacts only with natural gas in the New England grid. So we could build all the wind everywhere in Vermont, and we will not shut down the coal plants in New England, and we will not reduce or save any mountains in West Virginia. I, I listened to a podcast recently of a public hearing on the Cape Wind fight, and was fascinated to hear that people from the coal region had come up to advocate and say, you have to make this sacrifice to save the mountains. But that's not how the New England grid works. And so the way that it's supposed to work with wind in New England is that when the wind is blowing, then some plant will back down. And the coal plants can't back down in New England. The natural gas plants can, although they become inefficient. And so there is, there is a, a, a logical way for wind to be used in New England, but it's not going to save a single mountain in West Virginia. And I think the subtle thing there is that I think a lot of people assume that by getting wind going here, we're going to launch the whole industry and it's going to spread and it's going to end up being down there as well. That's where the resources come in. You look at the maps, it's not there. They don't have a good wind. They have hardly any at all. One of the West Virginia you, mountains have, is where more bats were killed than any other place. Too. They, yeah, the few places where they have built it, there's a little bit down there, but it's, it's completely, the resource is completely negligible. But they have a lot of solar. They have a lot more solar than we do. So they're ideal for that. That's, that's really what we should be pushing down there as a solution to global warming. Are we are not not the line Yes. I, I heard someone on the radio the other day who said you could get so much more bang for your buck with solar hot water than with solar water. That's right. Solar water is great. And, and you ought to be pushing that much more. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that? She said that you can get more bang for your buck with solar hot water. It has a much shorter payback and uh, it it actually does address climate change and greenhouse gas emissions because then you're not using fossil fuels. I should have included that on, that, on this list. That, this list is probably, that's another big one that should be on there because yeah. that's, uh, just in China, for example, they have 
hundreds of millions of solar hot water collection systems now, all of which have been put in the last five, ten years. You go to China, they're all over the apartment buildings, everywhere. For $250. Go. For $250. Wow. They're very cheap. They're very simple. I'm not sure I'd want to live with the $250 systems, but they work, and, and, and they like them. Um, and the number of power plants that's equivalent to is enormous. So from a greenhouse gas perspective, and we've been mostly focusing on electricity here, but if from the larger picture, that's a really big cost-effective one. So why not put in Vermont $100 million into that and not win? Why is it going, if you start to look at this, there's no rational evaluation of these alternatives going on. It's just it's, sort of happy. It, it, well, it's actually very political, as you point out, and there is tremendous pressure on these agencies, and they've told us that, to get the permits out. And so it is coming down from the highest levels, mm -hmm. from the energy secretary, from the interior mm -hmm. secretary, to get these permits out and get these projects built. And so it is uh, actually being viewed more as a job creator and not so much as a uh, way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in, in New England. The job creation, although we've seen in the Sheffield project, they come from Maine, they come from Louisiana and Utah, and they're there are some local jobs. There's some a security guard being paid to keep people off the site. So that's that's the kind of jobs that we're seeing. So if they build all these um, wind turbine com complexes all around the, the uh, ridge lines in Vermont, all those areas all the way down these ridge lines will be no trespassing to Vermonters, right? Yeah, it's just add, it's just another issue. Just, well, it would be all no, no trespassing yeah. to us. People assume it's going to be like a park that they can go walk. Yeah, and through. so it's only accessible by an out of at this point, an out-of-state or an out-of-country utility, right? That's it. They have they have to keep people out of most of them, I think, because they're worried about vandalism. Right. They're worried about ice throw. Safety. Uh, safety issues. The manuals say stay 12 to 1,500 feet away from them. So basically, the property owners who are seeing setbacks of less than 200 feet, and that's true for all the projects that have been approved, are are have a takings issue, with so that you know they can't really go up on their property certainly during winter and not risk ice throw. And that, the ice throw can go quite a ways, blade throw can go quite a ways. It's, it, it's, it's, it's a lot more complicated than most people realize. Right. I, I actually did the physics calculation. It's interesting. If the ice comes off the blade, just at a 45 degree angle trajectory, it gets its maximum trajectory. It can, mm -hmm. it can go a couple hundred feet. And, and you know, getting hit by a, a 10 pound chunk of ice going uh, 150 miles an hour is wow. not a pleasant experience. <laughs> so are we saying that Vermont doesn't have like a 25 year plan to get to some point? There's, well, there's no apolitical commission? No, no. What, what we have something called the speed program right now, which sets targets of utilities to pr produce a certain amount of their uh, electricity from renewable sources by certain dates. Um, and it's relatively aggressive. It's what some of the utilities are using to justify these projects, that they have to meet these targets. It's a little bit funny because they're saying, well, we have to, this is what the law says, we have to meet this target, but they're the ones that really basically lobbied the law through and approved it. Do you <laughs> so, want to explain what the problem is with the but, speed program? Yeah, the problem, well, the main problem with it is it sets these targets for utilities, but there are not strong incentive programs on supporting smaller scale stuff to, 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 so that they can play at a, at a significant level in that. And, Wind projects are not subject to Act 250, so all the environmental criteria for uh, wind projects is essentially short-circuited, what we should have in place. So we have no protection for bad projects, we have no real support for good proje for projects. And then, well, and then there's other problems with the SPEED program. The SPEED program allows the utilities to sell their renewable energy credits out of state, um, which basically suppresses renewable energy generation elsewhere. Uh, and the idea was, politically, this was, uh, there was a lot, our, our former utility lobbyist, a legislator um, who over, oversees the committee, <laughs> who got this in place, basically justifying it, saying, we can sell the RECs out of state and make more income and we'll have the renewable energy generation here. Thanks. Without looking at the big picture of what does that do to the regional renewable energy generation uh, situation and well, and, and also we've seen some utilities actually claiming we're making renewable energy for Vermonters while they're selling the RECs, so they really can't make What's a REC, claim. please? It's a renewable energy credit, okay. and it's a certificate that just says uh, that the, that renewable energy project generated 
X number of kilowatt hours on a certain date. So if they're selling the RECs, then you can buy renewable energy from the utility and you pay more for the renewable energy, then they need to retire those RECs. But if they're selling them out of state, they can't claim that it's renewable energy for Vermonters. Yeah, so there's the double counting issue which you mentioned. And, and then secondarily, it makes wind projects look more financially attractive to utilities. So it further imbalances the scale. We're missing the incentives for small scale stuff and then the wind, wind projects are made that much more attractive. So the, the playing field is uh, nowhere close to level. It's a thousand to one in terms of support for big scale stuff and missing the small scale stuff. Vermont did have a small program, solar, solar center program, uh, which paid like a, it, originally it was a couple bucks per kilowatt hour, or sorry, per, per, per kilowatt of, uh, sorry, per watt. It was an incentive, an upfront rebate that was funded by, by Entergy. It was a deal with state cut with Entergy. Um, and of course, Entergy now is probably going away or is in limbo, so that the funding for that is completely uh, in question. Uh, and they were supposed to put through, supposedly supposed to put through some kind of new legislation to renew the solar rebate this year. And that got all mucked up. The governor proposed a tax on, on rate, or sorry, the legislature proposed a, a 55, cent. 55 cent surcharge surcharge on everybody's utility bill. And some of that, and then it, then it turned out that that violated a campaign promise the governor had made so he couldn't support it. So the program got all mucked up, and a, uti a, a renewable energy developer stepped in and cut a deal with the governor to just make a thing whereby his projects would be protected over the next couple of years. And they and accept an upfront cash up amount instead oh, that's of one. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 the, and the whole and the consideration of how we're going to fix this pro program and get it going was delayed until the next session. So it just. Yeah. But the hope is that solar comes down to a price that and is financeable so that, for instance, lots of Vermonters have snowmobiles and ATVs. And those are $5,000, $8,000 machines. And you see in boats, you see a lot of what, you know, trailers with these uh, investments in front of them. And that kind of money could just as well go for solar hot water or for photovoltaics. And I can say from experience that there is a lot of pleasure in generating your own electricity and in taking a really nice, hot, long shower like I did today, entirely heated by the sun. And so if, if you know, people talk about payback, well, I don't think that people who ride ATVs or snowmobiles think about payback. They think about feeling good and having fun. And so that's one of the things that we need to, to look at uh, our energy investments now is something that makes you feel good and you're doing your part. And there is even now the opportunity to actually get off the grid as, as the technologies move forward. We're getting really down into the psychology of how you <laughs> promote solar and things like that. There's a lot of interesting questions. And then what yeah. happens when your, your system breaks down? My and system has never broken down. Well, what if it did? And it's the middle of winter, it's 20 below. Then you, you have backup, you have heat, right? You have wood heat or what do you, do you see what I'm saying? Like you're not, if the electric company doesn't come and fix things for you, it's in your hands. Solar is so incredibly reliable. Okay. I mean, I can say that for 20 some years, I mean, I had an inverter that was kind of outdated and even that we could get on the phone and there's a lot of technical support out there. Okay. There are a lot of people in, who are, are technically quite competent who can come and do any like wiring or rewiring. Um, the, the hot water system has had a few glitches in terms of not for the hot water for the water, but for my heating, which is kind of experimental. And um, some of the relays and things have, have broken, and so you know, the guy comes and fixes them. But it's not a, it's, it, it is so incredibly reliable. I, I have fun when people in my neighborhood say, well, did you lose your power? Well, I never lose my power. <laughs> and so if you want reliability, I can't say enough about solar. It is so incredibly reliable. Huh. Yeah, I, in terms of, of technology, I was building solar hot water systems in the 70s. Yeah. And, um, that the, the, the numbers are incredible. I mean, 20% of the most home utility cost is domestic hot water. Uh, payback from a solar hot water system. 
I haven't looked at it in years, but it was something on the order of five years. I think it's two to three years, years now. Payback, yeah. 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 It was five. I have a little more conservative opinion on that, but it's short. Mm -hmm. it's, it's short. It's it, very it, well within the it's <laughs> within It's within the lifetime of the system. Yes. That's not yet true of federal law tax, um, but it is of, of domestic hot water. Um, why isn't every house in the country equipped with solar hot water? Yeah, it should be in our countries that you know, have a great deal of it, like Denmark. Well, and when, when you want to talk about green jobs, those are real green jobs. You, you have to have a plumber, you have to have uh, some, somebody to come install it. And so that's really the push now from the federal level is green jobs. And there, you're right, there's nothing that would be better than massive solar hot water. Somebody did a calculation for one of these wind projects of how many solar hot water systems you could put in in Vermont, something like 5,000. Wow. For one, for the cost of one of these, it's twenty percent of the utility usage for home heating and yeah. home energy. Yeah, it's huge. huge. Well, we're engaged in a campaign in Addison County right now to bring solar hot water here through the deeper campaign. We always have an acorn energy co-op advocating for solar hot water discounts. So it's here. You know, it's just that um, it, it's exactly what we're talking about. It's packaging it in a way that people can see that it really truly is affordable. There, there is a difficulty too with solar is that, uh, or anything you have to buy up front. Mm -hmm. And we expect people to add these systems to, it, at least traditionally, we ex we've, we've act, we, in the past we've expected people to add these systems by buying it like a commodity, like you would an RV, put a big down payment down or pay the full cost up front. Whereas when we buy a house, or you, know, you buy the roof on your house, when you buy your house, right? It's part of the infrastructure of the house, it's folded into the mortgage. We have to get to the point where yeah. solar hot water and things like that are just part of the infrastructure. They're financed right along with everything else. They're expected equipment. Uh, so we have this paradigm problem. Yeah. With PV, some companies are trying to get around that, I think successfully, like uh, All Earth Renewables, David Litterdorf's company, and many others, uh, Sun Edison and some others, where they offer a system to somebody and maybe they pay some of the system cost up front but a small amount, a couple thousand dollars or less. And they lease it. And they lease it, and they buy the electricity. They buy it on a per kilowatt hour basis. That brings it into the normal normal financial structure. Solar hot water should be done similarly. It needs to be as common as a refrigerator. You just don't think about it. Yeah, here's, here's the solar Something hot water. Something everyone gets. It's yeah. part of the house. Another thing Vermont did was, was, yeah, I was going to say PACE. So Vermont passed a law that allows something called property assessed clean energy. Uh, communities can designate themselves as they vote to as clean energy assessment districts, and then the municipality or the community can set up a loan program uh, where basically they issue a bond, a taxable bond. People can get a loan to put on the system on their house, and then they pay it back through the line item on the property tax. The beauty of a PACE program is that it separates the investment from the property owner. It's a, so it becomes part of the property. So it's, it's a step in that infrastructure thing. Potentially, it's long-term low interest. Uh, a lot of communities in Vermont are trying to set that up. Vermont Bond Bank is going to be the central uh, distributor of the bonds, so, or seller of the bonds. So that, that could work like gangbusters. PACE is the only program I have seen yet that I think has the potential to marshal huge amounts of money on a billion dollar sort of scale, even in a state like Vermont, to do massive upgrades in, in thermal efficiency of buildings, solar hot water. It's the only proposal I've seen yet that could, I think, really do the job. So I think PACE is really exciting. However, I think it makes more sense on a statewide level. Um, there are some communities, like my community, who I can see will never do it. And so it would be, I, 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 at the VCAN conference a, year, a little over a year ago or two years ago, there was a long discussion about the PACE program, and people were asking really good questions. And it went on, in fact, it took over the next speakers uh, session, and it really was very complicated. And the, the person who was there, I think from VEIC, uh, Efficiency Vermont, talking about it said, yes, this would make a whole lot more sense if it was on the statewide level. Now, tomorrow night, the um, VEIC is holding a public meeting in Rutland. On, they're doing two of them. I guess the other one is in Barry. Which was today. Okay. What, right. What's the acronym you're using? Vermont Energy Investment Corporation. They're the ones that are subcontracted to run the Efficiency Vermont program. Okay. And so they're holding these meetings about 
efficiency, Vermont, mm -hmm. I guess, and brainstorming ideas. Do you know what the purpose is? Yes, they're they're um, having energy committees and citizens evaluate their outreach programs and make recommendations to them about what works or doesn't work or what they would like to see right. from efficiency in Vermont going forward. Vermont is one of the only states in the union that has an efficiency utility, mm. uh, which is efficiency Vermont. And, uh, it's a good. It's a good thing. It, 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 I think it's nice because you, when utilities offer energy efficiency, it's a little bit like saying, you know, somebody offering you, um, here's a candy bar. Um, and by the way, you should eat healthy. You really should eat healthy. But here's a candy bar. <laughs> you know, there's a conflict of interest there. Utilities want to sell energy. So Vermont was wise enough to set up a separate entity that could actually compete with the electricity selling utilities. I think one problem with efficiency Vermont is they would a little bit myopically focused on oh. electricity right. because that's been a, that was their mandate. Right. No, that's why I was so excited when they did the Vermont Community Energy Mobilization and Button Up campaign, which they're contracting. Right. Yeah. You know, and that's my feedback. It's like, don't do that. Yeah. You know, we that's mm, wrong direction. Like we want to be expanding those and supporting those programs. The well, state where I used to do advocacy in in, 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 uh, in New Mexico uh, before moving to Vermont, um, they. Um, they passed a law, which I didn't like, which the utilities were still responsible for energy efficiency. But what they got to do is, if they decreased the electricity usage, they got to increase the electric bills to cover the difference. Oh, wow. yeah. To cover their loss? So basically getting the citizenry and the ratepayers to pay for what they're not buying, not getting. Wow. It was, I thought, that's ethically a really questionable deal. So that's the other solution out there. For so, so we're expecting the state energy plan to be released mid-September, and then public hearings are going to be scheduled, to, I guess, a series of five of them, the week of September 26th. So pay attention to that if you want to have input and give your comments on this plan that is the result of a lot of uh, outreach in public and uh, taking public comment. So there, there will be a very quick opportunity coming up to your neighborhood soon. Two things. If you didn't have a chance to sign in on your way out, I'd appreciate it if you sign in on the clipboard right there on the edge of the table. Um, we'd love to have your contact information, whatever you're comfortable giving. Second thing, there's a stack of cards on that table too. Uh, they're actually, it's the, it's by-sided. And what, it's the last slide you saw here and the last slide of the Nets presentation. So 40 things you can do and what the optimal uh, pathway is for carbon uh, you know, optimization slash uh, reduction of emissions. So take that just for reference and so you have all of our contact information too on your way out. So thank you guys for spending a sunny um, Wednesday <laughs> evening with us. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you.